We have been asking some troubling questions of faith. This may be one you have asked or you have heard. You've been in a group and talked about. Why would a good God allow suffering? Ever asked that question? Oh, yeah. Ever been feeling bad or had a friend feel bad or been to the hospital and just wonder why, God, are you allowing this? Why is there suffering? If you're all-knowing, you're aware of everything that goes on, you're all-powerful. You can do anything. You can prevent. If you care so much, why do so many bad things happen in the world? God, why is there suffering? Our world contains a lot of sorrow and evil. And some people conclude, if we have an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God, then He can't possibly be all three of those at the same time, or there wouldn't be suffering. Right. <clears throat> so there's a theory out there that the best we can hope for is a two out of three God. <laughs> In fact, we even say, what? Two out of three ain't bad. That's a song. Yet, when we're talking about God, two out of three for many of us here isn't good enough. I think if I asked for a raise of hands, most of you would say God is all-powerful, He is all-knowing, and He is all-loving. But there are those that are suffering, those that are not walking in the light that would ask that question, if that is true, Maybe the best we can hope for is two out of three. So let's look at the two out of three God. First, if God is all-knowing and all-powerful and isn't very loving, if that's the kind of God we worship, He is all-knowing and all-powerful, isn't very loving, then God just doesn't care enough about suffering. I mean, He knows about it, and He's powerful enough, but He's not loving enough. He, at best... He's just interested in it. And at the very worst, he delights in the pain of his creation. Well, that's not something we would probably uh, fall into. But what about the second? What if he's all-powerful and all-loving, but, but he just lacks the ability to know? In fact, so, there's just so much going on now that just some things slip by him. Uh, he, do, he does love, and he, and he is powerful, but... He, it's just too big now. The world grows every year and it's just gotten to be a bit more than he can handle. Maybe like Washington. <laughs> and so some of that suffering and evil just slip by. Well, how about maybe he's all-knowing and all-loving, but he just isn't all-powerful. He's just a little too weak to, to take care of all the suffering. He, he would like to, he knows about it, he, he loves us, but he, he just isn't strong enough. Well, well, let's look at those options. If, if that's true, if option one is true, that he's knowing and, and powerful and doesn't love, well, you know, that leaves us with a pretty scary guy, doesn't it? I don't think we worship a scary God who knows everything and is strong enough, just doesn't love us enough to take care of it. That would mean he's unrestrained. It might even be immoral could even be that we would see that as torture. He's torturing his creation. And I don't think he changes the rules on us. It's not like gravity is working today, photosynthesis actually does work, and tomorrow we wake up and things are floating, we find out the photosynthesis doesn't work. In fact, we understand now that justice is no longer a virtue, in fact it's become a vice. Well, that, that's really not, not what we do, because if, if that were true, then God would be warped. We don't worship a warped God. None of us goes to bed worrying whether the sun's going to rise tomorrow. We know that there's some constancy, there's, there's some predictability to our universe. And, and, be, and, and that speaks to a God who is all-powerful, all-loving, and all-knowing. That We have that predictability, that we, we believe that tomorrow that God will be strong and wise and the sun will rise and the moon will come out tonight. Well, option two is you know, he's powerful and loving, he just, he just doesn't know. I mean, it's too big, it's gotten by him, it's slipped by him. That, that would mean 
We worship a God that's blind. He's a God that can't see it all. Strong and loving, but, but He can't foresee these things of suffering. Um, he doesn't know what's going on. Or, or maybe if He does, it just takes Him a while to figure it out. Well, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't hold any logic to the God that we read about in, in the Bible. Why would God allow this? If He created time, He could just rewind it and fix it. That was the case. And that's not the kind of God we worship. How about the last one? That He's knowing and loving, He just doesn't have the power. Well, then that, that would make God a sissy God. He's just not powerful enough to do it. He knows about it, He, he loves us, but He just, he just not, doesn't have enough power. And you know, that seems kind of ridiculous if we say that God actually created everything that we have <laughs> to say that He would not be able, not be strong enough to do that. And then we have the book of Job. The book of Job, I think, was put in here and written to help us understand, deal with, confront, and even minister to the suffering. And understand that why we suffer is not what we may think it is sometimes. Any of you ever played games with yourself? I compete with myself all the time. I unfortunately raised two kids that seem to compete with themselves. I used to compete with myself saying, you know, if I can throw that pencil in the box, I won't break my arm today. Or, I, you know, I'll be able to score 20 points in the basketball game if I'm able to do this. I can do those kind of silly games. And sometimes I think I still do those things. <laughs> but the book of Job is almost like a play. We could read it like a play. Now, I'm going to tell you, I believe, I believe, if there was a Job. But, but you don't have to. And there are plenty of scholars out there that would tell you uh, maybe there wasn't a Job. Maybe it was a book written like a play for us to understand and learn about suffering. Either way. I think there was a Job. It, he, he's written about in Ezekiel later on by a prophet. Also talked about in James later on in the New Testament. I think it was real. But wherever you stand, it could be a play. And this play has who in it? Job. Mrs. Job. Mrs. Job. Job's friends. Satan. And God. That's your players. And so when, they, when we read this book, we have to read it understanding that Job is the main character. Things are going to happen to him. And people are going to tell him about his suffering and why it's happening to him. One of those is it must be Job's fault. The reason you're suffering because of what you've done. Anybody heard, oh, you better watch it. God's going to get you. Right? <laughs> I did this. Oh, God's going to get you for that one. Well, that's where Job finds himself. And so Job's wife, Mrs. Job, is the first one to respond to him. And she responds to him with what we read today. We can look at Mrs. Job in a couple different ways. But let's look at what happened. Job now is a man that has a lot. A lot of land. A nice house. He has beautiful cars in the form of great camels. <laughs> Sheep, donkeys, all the animals of the day he has more than plenty of. And more than plenty of land to feed them and care for them. He has everything. And even greater than all that, he has ten children. And one day he wakes up and all of that is gone land, his animals, his house, and all ten of his children dead. And if that is not enough, it not only that has been taken away, but now Satan has inflicted pain on Job in the form of sores from the top of his head to the bottom of the thing. He is nothing but sores and pain and oozing and pus. Do you get the picture? He's suffering. 
and he is in enormous pain and he doesn't know why. He had it all. Great house, great land, great animals, great family, great wife. And now his wife who comes to him first suggests that Job, you ought to put, put an end to all this misery. Just curse God and die. Mm. Now, I, I don't, you know, I'm an apologist for a lot of people in the Bible, probably because I'm a great sinner. And so I'm going to apologize for Mrs. Job who gets a bad rap for many people. You know, Mrs. Joe came in and said, curse God, die, because she wasn't a very nice woman. She didn't love God. But think about it. Mrs. Job has lost everything too, including being the mother of ten children. Right. So maybe it wasn't that she was so upset with Job, the way he was acting, not cursing God, but maybe she just felt horrible about all that she had lost and now she sees a husband that's in great pain oozing with sores from his head to his toe. Job, just curse God and die. Maybe that's where she was. But at least we know that if she was bitter, if she was going to blame somebody, you could understand where she was coming from with the great loss and looking at her husband in such great pain. What's interesting today, though, is when we see people in suffering, we have people that don't believe God exists, right? And then we find some people suffering, and the people that don't believe God exists will blame God for the suffering. Isn't that interesting? I find that interesting. We have a lot of people who won't even worship God, don't talk to God, don't pray to God, don't read when God is talking to us, and will curse God, and then at the same time, never gave them a chance to even work in their life. You can't have it both ways. But we do understand Job is asking why. How about this one? So it must be my fault. Job has three friends come and visit him and they spend a few days with him and they don't speak. They just spend time with Job. Great friends. Just spending time with Job at his, at his side while he is suffering, while he has these sores. They're, you know, they, they're watching him pick his scabs with a broken piece of pottery. Think about that. You ever dropped a piece of pottery and watched it break and then want to scrape your skin with it? How about scrape your open scabs here with it? That's what Job's doing. And they're watching him. And so they've had enough, and they say this in Job 4. Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Job, you can't be innocent. This can't happen to somebody who's innocent. You must have sinned. Come on. Admit your sin. That's where it is. God is punishing you for your sin. Job 15. All his days... The wicked man suffers torment. See, Job, you, you were wicked. You did something. We didn't see you, but you did something. You lost everything. All your children are dead. You, your wife is telling you to curse God and die. You've lost it all. Well, what did you do? Just, just admit your sin. Job 20 has a great Bible word. I don't think we use it much. If any of you use it, please use it in front of me. The mirth, mirth, the mirth of the wicked is brief, the joy of the godless lasts but a moment. The mirth. What's it like that word mirth? Amusement. Hilarity. Social merriment. You know, a lot of events at Sylvan Abbey have a lot of mirth with them. We don't put mirth on our, on our advertisements, do we? We don't have to come to Sylvan Abbey for some times of mirth. <laughs> I like that word, though. I need y'all to use that. The cool thing about mirth is it can't mean joy or cheerful because mirth means noisy. Noisy merriment. Well, that's what we have here, don't we? Yes. But, but in Job 20, it says, the mirth of the wicked is brief. Brief. And the joy of the godless lasts but a moment. 
Joe, what is friends are coming? Joe, Joe, uh, what, I want you to face it. You sin. Uh, um, you reap what you sow. You got what you deserved. Now just admit your sin. That's, that's what the friends were saying. But then we get another perspective. The last perspective we get is God's perspective. It's probably going to be different than Mrs. Job's perspective. It's probably going to be a bit different than, than the three friends' perspective. He rebukes the friends because he says they lack compassion. So what you're saying, friends, is you're giving your friend Job the wrong message at the wrong time. When people are in pain, God does not, God does not act out of a platitude. He, he answers it in a God perspective. And so when you see the problem of pain and suffering from God's perspective, you can find true whole sense in the answer. So Job demands an answer from God. God, why? Why am I suffering? Look, listen to God's answer. This can only come from God. Job, where were you when I hugged the constellations? Can you explain to me, Job, where light comes from? How did darkness come to be, Job? Can you understand the miracle of how conception takes place? Job, can you tell me, can you answer those questions for me? And see, we might not like that answer, but Job, who is suffering, he knows, he's reminded that you're right, you are God, and I am not. It was very satisfying to Job, and he says, surely I spoke of things I do not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Therefore, I despise myself and I'll repent in this dust in this dust and ashes. Not enough. I want an explanation. How many of you have it? I want an explanation. Not enough, Pastor. I'm not. I must not be Joe. I want more. See if this is you. I think sometimes this is me. When calamity strikes someone I love, when Rhonda's hurt, when my children are hurt, I want an explanation. What's happening here? But when calamity strikes me, I want comfort. I don't need an explanation. Just comfort me. Just help me in my suffering. God doesn't owe Job an explanation. God doesn't owe us an explanation. Because maybe if God actually explained all of this, 99% of it would go over our head anyway because he's so much greater than we can understand. I mean, how many times do we just go, oh, that's a God moment. Explain it. I can't. God worked this out. How did he work it out? I, he just did. That's where we are. Philip Yancey, I would, I would recommend Philip Yancey for your reading. Some of you probably have read it. He's an American Christian author out of Atlanta. Actually, he wrote a really good book. Uh, I've read parts of the book. It's a great book. What I've read. What is so amazing about grace? Maybe some of you have read it. If not, I, I, would, I would recommend that. He's got a new one out that I like. We call Vanishing Grace. Philip Yancey writes a lot about, about grace. And he says, maybe sometimes God keeps us in the dark about why. Not so much because he wants to keep us in the dark. As because he knows we're incapable of absorbing the light. So what's the point of problems? What's the point that we're not all, none of us, are immune to pain? And the beautiful thing that Jesus says, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and send the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The beautiful thing of that is it's not because of anything you've done. It's not your sin that causes you to suffer. It's just life. Whatever hardship, hardship I'm facing, I'm not the first one to face it. I'm not going to be alone. There are others out there before me. There are others out there that can speak to me. It's not because I'm a sinner. God has not singled me out for cruel and unusual punishment. If others have gotten through this, if others have dealt with this, I can deal with it too. And that helps when we're in trouble. Now, I, 
I had to, uh, I had to go and, and look up some people a lot smarter than me about the purpose of problems in our lives. Because there is a purpose to the problem. It can't be just problems. There's got to be more to it. We live in a bigger, we, we, we believe and trust a bigger God than that. And because we trust and believe in a bigger God than that, we can't just let problems be meaningless. They must be teaching tools. And so I, I looked up what Rick Warren, who is the saddleback preacher, you probably know, the purpose-driven life guy. He has five points of why God uses problems in our lives. Number one, God uses trials to direct me. God uses trials to direct us. Donkeys, donkeys are a pack animal, and they are stubborn. And sometimes they need a little bit of a kick to get them going in the right direction. Kind of seems like humans have a lot of things in common with donkeys. We're a bit stubborn. Sometimes we need a little you know, hit on the side of the head to get us going. Proverbs 20 says, Problems can point us in a new direction and motivate us to change. Ever had a problem in your life that changed your direction? You went, looking back, you went, Boy, I am happy I went through that. If you haven't, I'm just be surprised. How about this one? God uses trials to inspect me. You ever heard humans being compared to tea bags? You never know what you're going to get till you put one in hot water. <laughs> James says, in James chapter 1, when you have many kinds of trouble, you should be full of what? Joy. What? I thought I was going to say sorrow. Though. No, it says joy. James says, when you have many kinds of troubles, you should be full of joy because you know that these troubles test your faith and this will give you patience. Ooh, that's a word, isn't it? Patience. So God is going to move you in a new direction. He's going to teach you patience, patience as you accept your problems with joy. I know it's hard. God uses trials to correct me. You all like being corrected? You all like being corrected. We know that there's some lessons we can only learn through pain and failure. How many parents, you know, don't put your finger in the light socket. Don't touch the stove. But we have to do that. Sometimes we have to use problems to correct us. Sometimes it's health, money, maybe it's a relationship, that we don't value it till we lose it. <clears throat> David says in Psalm 119, King David, The punishment you gave me was the best thing that could have happened to me, for it taught me to pay attention to your law. Ever had a problem that brought you back to the Bible? Ever had a problem that brought you back to a community of faith? Ever had a problem that had you seeking something greater than what you were around? God uses trials to correct us. God uses trials to protect us. We sometimes have a problem that can be a blessing because it can prevent us from doing something that is more serious. I actually know two people in my life that lost their jobs over ethics, and the people that they left eventually went to jail. They were unpleasant in their unemployment, but it was a lot better than being unemployed in jail. Sometimes trials protect us. God uses trials to perfect me. When we respond to trials and troubles, they can become what my parents used to always call, it's a character building lesson, son. <laughs> I like my character! <laughs> Romans 5, 3 and 4, we can rejoice too when we run into problems. They can help us learn to be patient. Patience develops strength of character in us. It helps us to trust God more each time. More each time we use it until finally our hope and our faith are strong and steady. God uses trials to perfect us. <coughs> Sometimes when I'm in pain, I'm too numb and too close to understand what's happening in front of me. C.S. Lewis, who wrote a great book on pain, C.S. Lewis, you really can't read too much of him, yeah. said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He whispers to us in our pleasures. 
He speaks to us in our conscience. But He shouts to us in our pain. God shouts to us in our pain. It is His megaphone to rouse the deaf world. You think God is speaking now? <laughs> Woo! God's speaking out there in this world, people. Even when I can't figure out what's going on, which is plenty, plenty of times, I know that when pain comes into my life, it can lift, it can lift me because it's a teaching tool. God is using it for me. I don't always like it. Sometimes I ask Him why again, and He brings me back to these Scriptures. God can use everything, no matter how painful, no matter how bad, for what? His glory, His gain. Life is really a series of problem-solving opportunities. And they can defeat you, but they can also develop you, depending on how you respond. Every cloud has what? A silver line. But let's think about this. Let's think about where people are this morning, where people are right now, people that are at the hospital, people that are in a car accident, people that are loading a loved one into an ambulance, people that are standing over a loved one who's just had a heart attack, why, God, why is this happening? Why is the young couple asking why my new baby has a disease and will suffer and have a shortened life? Why, God, why, God, was my friend who seemingly was healthy, was struck with cancer, and is now gone? Why, God, why am I at this traffic, traffic accident? I'm on my cell phone talking about the person in the car next to me who appears to be bleeding to death. Why, God, is that happening? Why is it that one of my children will call me and say, I am getting a divorce? Why do we take those phone calls? Why is that happening, God? Why is it that one of your parents may call you in the middle of the night and say, meet me at the hospital? Because one of them is not going to make it. Jürgen Moltmann, a great philosopher, said, God weeps with us so that we may one day laugh with him. That's the beauty about this God we worship. He is with us in our pain and our suffering. He actually will use that to perfect us. Perfect us. Because one day we will live in a, live in a perfect home with Him. And we will be laughing and laughing with Him. And enjoying the depths of God. That's what heaven is. God did not create evil. But He allows it so that we can have the freedom to choose right and wrong and have the freedom to choose to worship Him. <clears throat> we are free to choose to worship Him. God says, I don't like suffering. I don't like it. But I can make good come from it. Suffering will not always be part of, of this world, but for now you know you are in pain, but I am with you. I will hold your hand. I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you in your sorrow for a while if you just let me. Someday I will wipe it away once and for all. Someday your bliss will be so strong that your present suffering won't be worth comparing to it. God allows suffering so that He can be glorified and so that we can be in the name of God the Father and Jesus the Son and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit we thank you God for your message for your word for your walking with us when we are in pain and we are hurting and that we can feel your presence as you put your arm around us as you grab our hand as you walk us through those difficult times and when we look back we are better because we have walked through it with you our final hymn is number 593.